Hello and welcome to American Farmland Trust webinar on our guide to water quality, climate, social, and economic outcomes estimation tools presented by the authors, Michelle Perez and Emily Cole. Uh, my name is Ellen Yeatman and I'm the new water resources specialist at AFT and your host today. So American Farmland Trust is a national nonprofit founded in 1980. We here at AFT believe that saving the land that sustains us means one, protecting farmland, two, promoting sound farming practices, and three, keeping farmers on the land. First and foremost, we wanna thank our funders of this project, the Walton Family Foundation, the Mosaic Foundation, and the McKnight Foundation. Second, let me run through some webinar logistics. You all should have a go-to webinar panel that looks in general like this. So this panel can be expanded or reduced using the um, orange arrow here. And to optimize your viewing experience, take the time now to move and resize your viewer and your panel. Um, you can view the video full screen, but that panel will get in the way unless you have two screens. Just a little tip. Um, and in the panel, please use the questions tab to submit your questions and or comments. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation and we will answer as many um, questions as we can in the last 15 minutes. We are recording this webinar, as I mentioned. Um, we will make it available online along with other resources such as the opportunity to order a free print copy of the report. We will also send the link to the recording to everyone who registered. So please feel free to share this recording with others. Next, I'd like to introduce our presenters. So Dr. Michelle Perez is AFT's Water Initiative Director and lead author of this guide. Michelle leads AFT's efforts to achieve better water quality and reduce agricultural non-point source pollution through a comprehensive water initiative with an emphasis on outcomes quantification. Before joining AFT, Michelle worked at World Resources Institute and the Environmental Working Group, where she produced analyses on nutrient trading, cost effectiveness of conservation programs, and the importance of geographic targeting in water quality projects. Michelle has a PhD in environmental policy from the University of Maryland, where her dissertation was a three-state comparative study of farm nutrient management regulations. And both authors join us today. Dr. Emily Cole is AFT's New England Climate and Agriculture Program Manager. Since joining AFT in 2019, Emily works both to improve and advocate for the integration of climate smart management practices into New England's productive farming communities. She also leads AFT's Smart Solar Siting Partnership. Before joining AFT, Emily was an assistant professor of environmental science at Westfield State University. She earned her PhD in plant and soil science from UMass Amherst, where her research focused on improving soil health and carbon sequestration through the application of biochar and implementation of climate smart management practices. So those are our presenters today. And before our presenters take control, I'm gonna engage our audience with three polls. So, we have three poll questions for you to answer to give us a sense of who has joined us today and where your interests lie. So, the first poll is which one sector best reflects your occupation? Is it government agency, non-government organization, academic or other or corporation or environmental markets developer? or other. And as we're just going to wait a few seconds to let attendees respond, thanks everyone for your quick response. We're at 80% have voted, thank you. And I'm going to close this poll and share the results. Great, so we have a fairly diverse group of uh, attendees today um, with the majority of folks working for government agencies and NGOs. 
And our second poll, I'm going to launch here. So if there are only four types of audience members, which one best describes you? Developer of outcomes estimation tools, methods, and models, a current user of outcomes estimation tools, methods, and models, a potential future user of tools and of outcomes estimation tools and issues, or a person interested in learning about outcomes estimation tools, methods, and models. Thanks everyone for your rapid responses. Really appreciate it. We hope you find these questions interesting as much to you as they are to us. I'll give us a few more seconds. All right. Thank you. I'm going to share the results to those. Wow, we got a, yeah, it's great. Um, we even have some developers out there, current users, potential users, everyone. Um, Thank you so much. And last poll. So, what outcomes are you most interested in quantifying? And you can select all that apply. Is it water quality, greenhouse gas emissions, economic, or social outcomes? Give us a few more seconds. Thank you, everyone, for your rapid response. This is our last poll. There's a few more people still answering. All right, I share the results. Great, so we have at least you know, a group of people interested in quantifying all of these types of outcomes. Great, thank you so much. All right, so now with no further ado, I will pass the mic to Michelle to kick off the heart of this presentation. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'll start off by providing an overview of the new guide and share some definitions to get everyone on the same page and explain why we undertook this research. Then I'll conduct, I'll walk you through a few of the key tables listing the water quality, climate, and economic tools and compare and contrast a few tool features. Emily will share a few tips with you on how to use the guide to identify a tool or a method that might work for you. And then I'll wrap up by sharing recommendations we think will further us all along on our collective outcomes quantification journey. So just why are project level outcomes, just what are they, and why should we try to quantify them? In our guide, we feature this definition of outcomes associated with farm conservation practice adoption, which was provided by the five page RCPP expectations document from the Natural Resources Conservation Service Regional Conservation Partnerships Program in 2020. I'm gonna read it out as it's a nice way to get us all on the same page. Outcomes are the measurable environmental, economic and social impacts of RCPP project activities. Examples of outcomes are pounds of nitrogen runoff avoided, tons of carbon sequestration, cost savings to producers, number of neighboring producers adopting a practice, decision factors leading to producer adoption of soil health management systems, et cetera. Now on to the question of why quantify outcomes. Well, first of all, it is required by the RCVP in the 2014 and 2018 Farm Bills, and it is required by the EPA's Clean Water Act Section 319 projects. The announcement for pu public funding in 2014 said NRCS would prioritize project selection for the new RCPP program to those projects that promise to, quote, generate near-term results that are measurable from environmental, economic, and social perspectives. The 2018 Farm Bill refined statutory language further by requiring RCPP projects to conduct an assessment of the progress being made to achieve conservation benefits and report on the outcomes at the conclusion of the project. And it's not just the RCPP and EPA projects that are important here. We tried to come up with an estimate of how many farm conservation projects are out there, and one lowball 
estimate of mostly water quality oriented projects is 1,000. Topping the list are 600 ag-oriented EPA 319 projects, 400 RCPB projects, and about 60 Mississippi River Basin Healthy Watershed Initiatives or MRBI projects. But who knows how many other conservation projects are out there that are primarily state-led, county-led, or corporate-led. And of course, a lot of these projects may be double or even triple counted as they receive funding from multiple sources. The bottom line is there is a lot of project level farm conservation effort going on that could be doing more on outcomes quantification. <coughs> so with a lot of different projects underway, aside from the regulatory drivers associated with some of the projects, there are many good reasons to quantify outcomes. First, conservationists can provide farmers who are already using conservation practices with quantitative estimates of the environmental and economic outcomes they are already experiencing. Second, with that information, conservationists could infuse their existing education and outreach activities aimed at farmers on the fence about conservation with the quantitative findings about the farmers already doing the practices, likely making those events even more exciting and more effective. Third, once interest has been piqued, conservationists may be able to work with those on the fence farmers to improve conservation decision making and help get them to yes faster by running what if conservation scenarios that generate estimates of potential future outcomes associated with investment in conservation. Fourth, we believe conservationists should produce aggregated and cumulative estimates of the environmental results being achieved by farmer participation in their government funded projects and report those results to the public. And fifth, conservationists can assist farmers in evaluating credit generation opportunities for participation in emerging water quality and climate markets. And though this is not an exhaustive list of terrific reasons to quantify outcomes. Our last point uh, itemizes the importance of evaluating individual and aggregated environmental and economic results of farmer participation in corporate supply chain sustainability programs. So, <clears throat> pardon me, one primary goal of this outcomes estimation tool guide is to empower and enable our fellow conservationists to add outcomes quantification to their conservation toolbox. Already in the toolbox are education and outreach events and materials, financial assistance and technical assistance. Just imagine how much more effective we might all be if we added outcomes quantification to the toolbox as well. Well, we are envisioning a self-strengthening cycle where outcomes quantification leads to more conservation adoption. In this self-strengthening cycle, Farm conservation project managers provide FA, TA, education, and outcomes quantification services to farmers in their project area. Farmers respond favorably by adopting conservation practices promoted by the project managers. More quantification and dissemination of the environmental, social, and economic outcomes of those practices occurs. This inspires more farmers and gives them the confidence they need to adopt more conservation practices. And over time, landscape scale improvements begin occurring, such as improved water quality, greater resilience to climate change, and more prosperous farms. This guide began in earnest more than three years ago when AFD landed an RCPP project in the Illinois Upper Macoupin Creek watershed. We took the requirement to quantify outcomes seriously and conducted a review of a handful of models and tools that might work for us, our staff, our partners, and our budget in that watershed. As we detail in the report, our experience learning how to define outcomes, let alone how to quantify and report on them has been painful. Other colleagues at AFT encouraged me to share what we learned from our internal exercise so that it might help minimize the pain and suffering of our fellow conservationists. And with the help of Dr. Emily Cole, we cast the, the net wider than my initial effort, and we are pleased to share our findings with you today. Pardon me here. Regarding the scope and scale and methods of our effort, we focus solely on water quality, climate, 
social and economic outcomes. We chose to exclude tools and methods that enable outcomes quantification for water quantity, air quality, and wildlife. We also restricted our analysis to modeling estimation approaches for outcomes quantification rather than direct monitoring approaches. We stopped short of a full-fledged evaluation of the tools and methods because neither Dr. Cole nor I are modelers ourselves. To find models, tools, and methods to review, we cast the net wide by conducting literature searches in peer-reviewed journals, we asked friends and colleagues at NRCS, EPA, and other institutions, and we conducted an informal survey of watershed project managers to find out which tools or methods they were using to conduct outcomes quantification. It is important to note that we focused our interviews on tool developers rather than searching for and interviewing tool users. Please see the acknowledgments section of the report for a list of the many wonderful persons that reviewed our report and made it stronger. For links to the papers we reviewed that conducted comparative analyses of models and tools, see Appendix A. We share a good number of resources in Appendix B for projects interested in conducting monitoring in streams at the edge of the field, in tile drains, and conducting soil health monitoring. And in Appendix C, you'll see summaries of the 18 tools we reviewed but did not satisfy our criteria. Nevertheless, may be perfectly valid tools for other project needs. And in Appendix D, you'll find summaries of the 17 models we excluded because they did not satisfy our criteria. And again, may be perfectly useful models to quantify outcomes if you have the staff expertise on hand or a budget to hire partners to do the outcomes quantification for your project. So without further ado, here are the 14 tools and two methods that we selected amongst 51 models, tools, and methods that we reviewed last year because they satisfied our criteria. What criteria, you may ask? We established five criteria to help us figure out which tools to feature and which ones to mention in the appendices. First and foremost, we wanted tools that generate quantitative estimates of water quality, climate, social, or economic outcomes associated with ag conservation practice adoption. So index tools were excluded. Second, the tools and methods needed to be available to the public, either for free or for a fee. Third, we wanted tools that were built for use by conservationists or farmers. Fourth, we wanted to make sure that our fellow conservationists leading these many RCPP and other projects did not have to have computer modeling experience to use the tools. And finally, simply for expediency's sake, we decided to exclude, exclude tools that are only available for use in one state, even if they satisfied all the other criteria, just so we could finish the report. So here they are, table one, featuring all 14 tools and two methods, seven water quality tools and one method, three climate tools, one social tool and one method and three economic tools. You may be wondering what the difference is between a tool and a method. We defined a tool as a technical device intended to make the task of estimating outcomes easier. In contrast, we defined a method as a systematic procedure for accomplishing the task of estimating outcomes. Let me ease you into this table featuring seven water quality outcome quantification tools. I'll spend the most time on this table explaining the several items. First, we display the four tools that are available for use nationally. Step L in Region 5 by EPA, which are both Excel-based tools, Nutrient Tracking Tool and Model My Watershed, which are both web-based tools. Then we display three regional tools that are all web-based. PTM app is available for use in Minnesota and North Dakota. The CAS tool is available in the Chesapeake Bay, while Field Doc is also available in the Chesapeake Bay, but also Delaware Bays and Western Pennsylvania. One tip to point out is that the names of all the tools in this and similar tables are hot links. So if you click on, say, Step L, it will take you to the Step L tool website where you can start exploring the tool and all the associated resources offered there. Now on to the scale and purpose column. We categorize primary as the scale at which each tool was initially built to work at and secondary as an additional scale at which the tool can also be used. 
we use the term field scale for tools built to work with individual farmers to analyze their current or future adoption of conservation practices. Project scale refers to tools that estimate outcomes associated with uh, or for the project boundary, which could be county or watershed. And the term watershed scale is used for projects attempting to improve water quality of a specific watershed, excuse me, water body within a watershed. Step L was built to help 319 projects assess their project scale water quality outcomes that are watershed based. Users can also help Step L to estimate generalized field scale outcomes by starting a new tab in the Excel tool and treat the 10 data entry cells as though they represented fields. In contrast, nutrient tracking tool was developed primarily to assess individualized farm field water quality losses before and after conservation practice adoption, but it can be used to assess a project or a watershed scale uh, estimate of outcomes as well. Model Mine Watershed by the Stroud Center offers water quality analyses at the project and watershed scale. Now, the final column lists the water quality outcomes that are quantified by the tool and the degree of specificity with which the tool estimates those outcomes. We use the term field specific for tools that require farmer production and management data inputs and generate outcomes applicable to the field being analyzed. Tools with site specific analytical capabilities offer location based environmental data sets for soil slopes and weather and generate outcomes applicable to only that location. The majority of tools require watershed scale or county scale data inputs to produce generalized estimates of outcomes applicable to that watershed or county of interest. So, nutrient tracking tool is the only water quality tool that provides field specific and site specific water quality outcomes estimates because it requires farmer management information and it benefits from the location specific environmental data built into its underlying model. The rest of the water quality tools yield generalized estimates of water quality outcomes because they do not ask for field specific inputs from farmers and they mostly rely on large scale environmental data sets. <clears throat> when AFD was exploring three years ago how we were going to quantify our RCPP project water quality outcomes, we developed a method we lovingly refer to as the back of the envelope method. Our own Dr. Emily Bruner, AFT's Midwest Science Director, then formalized the method for use by the Illinois STAR Initiative, which stands for Saving Tomorrow's Agricultural Resources. And she produced a three-page methodology. Projects that want to estimate project scale, aggregated water quality outcomes, check this method out to see if it will work for you. Two requirements for using this method include the need to attain baseline nutrient and sediment loss information for your county or watershed and reduction efficiency values for the conservation practices your farmers are adopting. And then with a little bit of multiplication and addition, voila, you'll have a reasonable estimate of your project's nutrient and sediment reduction outcomes. Here are the three climate outcomes estimation tools that satisfied our criteria. <clears throat> Pardon me. Comet Farm and Comet Planner are tools developed by NRCS and Colorado State University, while Field Print Platform is developed by Field to Market. All three are web-based tools. Comet Planner offers the quickest generalized estimate of GHG reductions from conservation practice adoption at the county or the state level as results can be produced in just a few minutes with as little as four or five clicks to respond to the required four questions. Comet Farm and Field Prep Platform provide field specific and site specific estimates of the GHG outcomes listed in either metric tons or pounds of CO2 equivalent, but that requires interest and cooperation from farmers to share their production and management data in order to generate the field specific estimate of outcomes. Now moving on to the economic outcomes, 
Here is an excerpt of the definition for economic outcomes provided by the NRCS RCPP expectations document. It stated that economic indicators can quantify the financial impacts of conservation practices on a farm, ranch, or forest land. And the document provided uh, the following three examples, conservation cost effectiveness, economic or financial benefits, and valuation of ecosystem benefits. Here are the three economic outcomes estimation tools we found that satisfied our criteria. All are Excel-based tools, and the first two by NRCS and AFT, the cover crops tool and the retrospective soil health economic calculator are available for use nationally. While the third tool, the cropping system calculator by the land stewardship program is restricted to use in Wisconsin and in Illinois. All three economic tools provide analyses of the costs and benefits associated with cover crops. While the AFT RSHEC tool can analyze additional practices like alternative tillage and nutrient management for row crops, plus, plus mulching and compost application for almond production. The LSP CCS tool can analyze conservation crop rotation and grazing practices as well. As stated in the final column, the quantified economic outcomes are similar amongst the three tools, though a little different as well. <clears throat> and last but not least, we come to the social tool and method. The Social Indicators Data Management and Analysis Tool, or SIDMA, was developed by Purdue and Michigan State Universities in collaboration with EPA Region 5 staff. The tool assists watershed project managers in survey generation and helps them code the results and conduct analyses of the social indicators that can be collected at different phases of the project. The tool is based on the SIPI's Handbook, which stands for Social Indicators Planning and Evaluation Systems for Non-Point Source Management, a handbook for watershed projects. We refer to the SIPI's handbook as the social methodology in our report, as it offers guidance to project managers on how to plan projects and evaluate the effects the project interventions, such as outreach activities, are having on important social indicators. And here's the definition of social outcomes that we feature in the report from the 2011 SIPI's Handbook. Social outcomes are social changes needed to bring about and sustain the environmental conditions you are trying to achieve in your project area. Examples of social outcomes provided by SIPI's include increased awareness, changed attitudes, reduced constraints, increased capacity, increased adoption of practices. You can read more about these social outcomes and how to quantify them on page 55 of the SIPI's handbook. And now it is my great pleasure to turn you over to Emily. Thank you very much, Michelle, and, and welcome again to everybody joining us. I wanna start off by uh, going back to one difficulty that Michelle has already highlighted, and that is how do you whittle down the many options available for outcomes estimation tools in order to evaluate a few options a little more closely? I'm going to take a few minutes now to walk you through some of the schematics and tables from our guide that can compare and contrast key tool characteristics to help you narrow down your options. So first, uh, figure 11 titled, what purpose did the tool developer initially build the tool to satisfy? was designed to help users of this guide distinguish the where and what these tools might be used for. Then moving to the top of the figure, what you can see is that the position indicated by these yellow boxes indicates the scale the tool was designed for. The left-hand side indicating tools developed for the farm and field level. The uh, larger scale and the project scales are on the right-hand side, and those in the center can do both. If you look down below into the legend, you'll see the four colors indicating what the tool quantifies, whether it's economics, greenhouse gases, social or water quality outcomes. You'll also notice that all three economic tools are farm or field based, whereas our social tool and method are project level. However, we do know that they are collecting individual farm and farmer information um, so there may be potential use at other scales. Whereas looking at Step L, Field Doc, and PTM app, these are all located here in the center, 
indicating that they have the capability to estimate this, a single project location outcome and compile outcomes for multiple locations at the project scale. There are two additional features to point out. First, the long arrows coming from the boxes indicate either documented use, which is the solid arrow, or potential use, which is the dotted arrow, of this tool at additional scales. And lastly, the calculator symbol indicates that in order to track project outcomes, external summation by the UNER is required. It is not necessarily something that the tool itself will do. So I'd like to take a moment and refer you to another helpful aspect of the choosing tools section of the guide. In this section, we share some key questions that project leaders may want to ask themselves in order to identify which tools or methods might fit your project needs. Those questions and figure 11 can help you start narrowing down your options. So first and foremost, what are you quantifying? Are water quality or greenhouse gas outcomes quantifications or both needed? If both are needed, you might consider using the STAR method. Notice it's both blue and green. Or you might consider using a pair of tools that require similar input data, such as NTT and Comet Farm. Does this project expect to quantify economic or social outcomes? Oh, and does this quantification need to be at the field, whole farm, watershed, or project scale? Next, I'll walk you through table three, getting into the tool, getting started, and getting to the finish line. This table provides some foundational information regarding the access and data requirements for our featured tools and methods in the guide. First is the tool column. Below each tool name is a live link, and this will move you to the write-up for that tool within the document. Next column is getting in. This is how to access this tool or method, whether you need to download a program, sign up for an account, or access it via the web. Next is getting started. This column provides a snapshot into the first few steps that a user will have to complete to begin quantifying desired outcomes. And that last column, getting to the finish line, shows a qualitative scale representing the relative number of steps it would take start to finish to quantify outcomes based upon the adoption of cover crops as our example conservation practice. Again, I would suggest reviewing the guiding questions in the choosing tools section of this particular guide to assist in planning your outcomes quantification journey. Additional questions like, do project staff and farmers have the time to gather and process data? Some tools require a significant amount of data, and that may not be a possibility for your project. Do project staff have access to additional necessary data? Tools such as StepL have an input data server accessible online to provide access to location-based input data, while others require that data be sourced by the user. So understanding what data is required for each tool will also help you find the one best suited to your project needs. How experienced are project staff at using models and tools and interpreting input and results data? To reinforce something that Michelle spoke of earlier on, we wanted to ensure that our fellow conservationists did not have to be computer modelers to use the tools featured in this guide. If you do have staff with that experience, or if you have funding for external consultants to work on quantification, then as Michelle mentioned, there are additional options that you could consider, many of which can be found in Appendix C or D. Taking a moment and zooming in at the top of this table, you can see the range of relative steps involved just within the water quality tools. You'll notice that one field-specific water quality tool, NTT, is rated as a five because it requires the highest number of steps in the process to achieve a farmer-specific and site-specific water quality outcome estimate. In contrast, we rated the other tools as twos and threes, as they do not require attainment of farmer-specific information. Tools such as Region 5, Model My Watershed, and CAST require fewer steps, but do keep in mind they will produce more generalized outcome estimation. These schematics provide some important tool characteristics, but once you are ready to learn more about a specific tool, you can use the live page links to take you directly to that in-depth write-up. I'm going to walk you through one of those now. 
The 14 tools and two method descriptions begin on page 29 of our guide. And with each of the 14 tool descriptions, they follow the same format that's noted here. Beginning in section A with an overview and tool background, section B describes required inputs and the analysis options. In C, we detail the specific outcomes that are quantified by the tool. Section D highlights strengths and limitations. Section E, we provide examples of other conservation projects that have used this tool for their quantification uh, needs. And then lastly, each write-up ends with additional supporting and some logistical information. I'll walk you through these sections in a little more detail now uh, using our step L uh, first write-up as an example. Each tool write-up begins with the summary description. The, this section answers the set of questions you see on the left, including uh, some basic background on the tool, including who are the developers and what purpose was it developed for? The developers uh, were very kind in sharing a lot of the information with us and I want to take a moment to thank their very generous uh, support and working with us on this. Uh, so other things that you'll find here is what's the tool availability? Um, what scale? What geographic area? And can this tool be used for what if scenarios? Moving into section B. There are more tool specifics that, uh, such as what's the underlying model? So what data or data sets will this require? And does, is the data readily accessible to the user? This section also describes the conservation practices that the tool can estimate outcomes for. If your project is focused on the adoption of BMPs within animal agriculture, section B would be a great place to ensure that a tool will work for your project. Moving along to section C, here you'll find descriptions of the outcomes that are quantified by each tool, such as nitrogen, phosphorus loading, or uh, reductions for the water quality tools, along with the specificity of those outcomes, and if confidence intervals are provided by the tool. Also, uh, outcomes units and how the tool presents these outcomes to the users, whether it's tabular, graphical, or both, will be detailed here. In section D, we highlighted some of each tool's strengths and limitations, including helpful features such as mapped-based interfaces, like several of the tools described in this guide have. This section may also note where there would be a significant amount of external data collection required, or if the user can download the results easily, and if this tool has been reviewed uh, in some manner. Moving to E, through our own research and through our conversations with our developers and colleagues, we described other projects that have used this particular tool in their outcomes quantification. So here in section E, we're highlighting project partners, locations, and the estimated outcomes of their projects that were quantified using this tool. As we only included tools that were meant for use by conservationists and farmers, we worked to include these examples of our fellow conservationists using them. For example, step L, as described here, was used to estimate that the adoption of conservation practices across approximately 2,600 acres of this particular project in Wisconsin uh, will, they estimate, will result in a reduction of almost 2,300 pounds of phosphorus and more than 700 tons of sediment annually. Finally, in section F, you'll find logistical information such as the most recent version or the date of the most recent update to the tool. Web links to the tool's home pages, user guides, training, and other relevant materials will be found here as well. Also included in this section is a point of contact for each tool so that users or potential users can have that first point of contact if needed for questions. So, it's very important to point out that the tools and methods we've included in this guide have varying strengths and limitations. And we hope this guide assists project leaders review and evaluate the different features and weigh the trade-offs that might occur when you're trying to decide upon a tool. So for instance, if you have access and the farmer and staff time uh, is there required to input field-specific data, then tools such as NTT, Comet Farm, and the FieldPrint platform might work well for your project needs. 
if you do not have access or you don't have a need for site-specific outcomes, then you can consider Comet Planner, Step L, PTM App, or Field Doc. However, these tools will provide more generalized outcomes estimations. Other considerations include project location and availability of each tool. And additional trade-offs you know, may include the ability to track project outcomes, uh, differences in the user interface, additional mapping or GIS integration. Right, this model my watershed and field doc both quantify watershed uh, specific outcomes and both have mapping capabilities. However, model my watershed is not designed for project scale quantification, whereas field doc on the other hand can quantify outcomes at multiple scales. However, it's regionally limited to the mid-Atlantic. Another regional tool, PTM app, operating in Minnesota and North Dakota, offers geographic targeting capabilities to identify hotspots, which can aid in watershed planning. However, you must be in Minnesota and North Dakota to be able to use it. Each of the tools and methods featured in this guide have strengths and provide some great features, but each tool is going to have its limitations. You may be searching for the perfect tool for your project, but as Michelle and I have learned, and you likely all know, there's going to be no such thing as the perfect tool. Therefore, more likely than not, project leaders will need to prioritize those tool features that support your project goals and outcome quantification needs. This guide can help inform that process. And with that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle, who will share some of our recommendations for the many stakeholders in the conservation community. Take it away, Michelle. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I've switched to my phone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Michelle. Great. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you. Well, we're running out of time, and I'll try to speed through these recommendations as best I can. Um, first and foremost, we've got recommendations for tool developers. Uh, we offer recommendations that might make the developers of outcomes estimation tools more successful at supporting the possibly 1,000 project managers to become users of their tools. We recommend that they provide more helpful guidance and instructions. They include lists of projects using the tools to inspire confidence in other potential users. They expand the geographic applicability of the tool to more states, more practices, and more production systems. And, and because all of this takes resources, we recommend they advocate for more support for these activities from NRCS, EPA, state agencies, research and charitable foundations, and corporations with sustainability goals. For the project managers, we feel your pain. To set up for success, reach out to the tool developer to confirm the tool you're considering will work for your project. Review all the existing training resources on their website and ask for more training and coaching to oversee your initial use of the tool. If you find if the feature tools don't work for you, try the back of the envelope methods. And because all of these outcomes estimation activities take a lot of effort signal to those who can provide you with support that you need more guidance and more help to quantify outcomes and ask for tools to become usable in your neck of the woods. For NRCS, we recommend that the agency develop its own outcomes quantification handbook for RCPP and other project managers. And we're thrilled to report that NRCS said they would disseminate this guide to RCPP, MRBI, and NWQI project managers. We also recommend NRCS facilitates social outcomes training and coaching during the design of RCPP and other projects, as we believe social science is the cornerstone of effective conservation adoption efforts. And we encourage NRCS to facilitate frequent and ongoing training sessions and offer coaching. Finally, for Congress, USDA, EPA, state agencies, academics, research and charitable foundations, and corporations with sustainability goals, we recommend you support the tool developers and tool users to implement the many challenging activities recommended in this guide. We encourage you to support additional research on measuring outcomes beyond this initial assessment. And we call for an establishment of a nationwide data set for calibrating all outcomes quantification tools so they generate even more accurate results, can analyze more conservation practices, apply to more farm production systems, and in more state. States. This data set would lift all tool boats 
and make them more work better for tool developers and tool users alike. So we've got one more slide to figure out what could be next. Here are some ideas for next steps in our collective outcomes quantification journey. In addition to NSCS or other institutions, AFD can organize tool training webinars by the developers of the tools for RCPP and other project managers. Would you like that? That question and four others are in a one-page survey that will appear as a new tab in your internet browser when the webinar ends. Please take just a few minutes to share your feedback. AFD can also offer free coaching services to 10 farm project managers to help you figure out which tools or methods are right for you. If you're interested, just email me and in the subject line, write coaching request. And we welcome your assistance in helping make some or all of these recommendations a reality. Just email me to let me know and let's see how we can work together. So thank you for your attention. Let's turn it over to you now. Please type your questions and your comments in the question box. Thanks, Michelle. And I'm sorry to those of you who are having audio issues. Um, we hope um, we'll make sure when we post the recording that the audio is clear. And Emily and Michelle are available for questions in this last um, nine minutes until 11 o'clock. We understand that some folks have busy schedules, but um, we're going to take a second to look at the question panel. And um, Michelle and Emily, why don't you just pick out questions? Um, that I've flagged or um, newer ones that have been posted and start answering. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, I've, I've shown my webcam. I don't know if that's coming through um, or if that's going to cause some bandwidth issues. The video looks good on my end, Michelle. Um, and I did okay. have someone post that there was uh, some sort of outage in the East Coast or bad internet in the East Coast, so <laughs> unfortunate timing. Um, yes, yes. Well, why don't we go to the first question posted at 1011 by Chris Ostrander. He asked, you know, why not include soil when we were doing the poll and asking, you know, what outcomes do you want to quantify? What do you all say to that? That's a, that's a great question. We did include soil health monitoring resources in the appendix. And um, to the best of our knowledge, you know, we don't, we're not aware of quantitative tools for soil uh, health uh, modeling per se, um, and or we just, you know, the state of the science on that is, is, is emerging. Um, and so we, we went with what we knew, water quality, climate, social, and economic. But for monitoring soil health, there are resources available in the appendix. And Michelle and I did our best to do a wide sweep and, and, and try to catch as many as we could of these tools in our net for review. But we you know, are certain that it's not an exhaustive uh, review that we've done. And so if there are other tools that we're unaware of, we'd love to know what they are um, so that we can uh, add them to the list to review for the next version. Mm -hmm. I see a question from Lynn Knight. Why weren't SIG on-farm demonstration projects included the list of outcomes programs uh, listed? That's a great idea. We'd love to, you know, get that count added to the 1,000 counts so far. Um, most of those uh, projects, to the best of our knowledge, are trying to do direct monitoring. So they may not be dedicating resources to modeling uh, the soil health benefits or other water quality or climate benefits. But we'd love to dig into that question uh, with you, Lynn. I see a question here. The model discussion in the report only discusses dissolved reactive phosphorus for the EPA Region 5 tool, and DRP was not shown in the summary table. Is DRP estimation considered in your review? We certainly strive to be as, you know, as specific and as um, comprehensive as possible. So if you keyword search DRP, or dissolved reactive phosphorus in the um, Adobe Acrobat version of the report, we hope you find some tools that um, we know uh, are capable of providing quantitative estimates of that. And there's another question here. Are you aware of any studies to compare quantitative results from the various tools for the same project? Uh, Michelle and I reviewed quite a number of journal articles that uh, compared the tools 
I don't think I came across one that compared various tools for the same project to review and compare the outcomes, estimations of those. Um, but there was a lot of peer reviewed uh, comparison of the tools themselves available. Right. And we even offered a list of suggested follow up analyses. And one was, you know, do more of this comparison. Take one farm in one location and, um, you know, throw a bunch of tools at it <laughs> and see what you get. And be very careful. Like, you know, you know, be very aware for why you should not and you should expect some of the results to be similar, right? Like the tools ask different questions and they use different data sets. So we would not expect all of them to return all of the same results, would we? Um, I see a question here. What is the confidence of the generalized benefits? Um, if that question has to do with confidence intervals, this is an issue that Emily and I struggled with mightily, and so did the tool developers. I think several of them are already including confidence intervals in their tools, like NTT and Comet Farm, but others are struggling to do so. They have it on their to-do list, and they're in earnest working on that, um, and others have it on their back burner. So that is definitely, you know, still on the outcomes quantification journey for some tools. Looking few for, we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions from our list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a question about aquaculture. Did not tackle aquaculture. Thanks for that interest. Maybe that's your next project. <laughs> um. Another accuracy and precision question, um, you know, they are very important issues and how do we, how do you gauge the accuracy of a modeling tool? That's another great question um, and we worked with the developers to understand that aspect the best we could and um, our generalized outcomes versus site specific um, seems to be about as um, I would say widely adopted of a comparison as we can get right now, um, but those site specific tools and those developers are working to get more uh, detailed information regarding the confidence intervals, as Michelle mentioned. Okay. Maybe one last one. <laughs> <laughs> the aquaculture uh, question asker said it that it's her uh, next project, so that's very exciting. <laughs> There's a, a long question here. Was there a common denominator? Uh, I hope this hasn't been read out yet. Um, per, for that is parameter that groups could start collecting as an input that would put them in a good place to start these tools methods. In other words, what's a good place to start in terms of collecting data to run these tools? Oh, excellent question. Um, well, we're assuming that uh, you're a farm conservation project manager and therefore being able to know which practices are being adopted and how many acres or units of those practice is the, the first and foremost step right out of the gate. And then being able to transform practice counts and practice types into environmental uh, uh, outcomes is the next step. So uh, the back of the envelope approach would work for you if your county and watershed have uh, baseline nutrient and sediment losses. Um, and you could use Comet Farm for the GHG aspects. Um, but those are the first two steps getting started. Um, there's a good question by Jane Frankenberger that I can post if you want to show that one. Sure. Could you go ahead and read it out? It's, there, yeah. There's a lot of... All right. So Jane Frankenberger asked, do you know of any efforts that have compared the estimated outcomes if different tools are used? It would also be great to know if anyone on this webinar knows of such efforts. I think we mentioned that in the appendix, there are, uh, there's at least one paper, Emily, if you remember, uh, in the appendix that does that. Yeah, in the appendix where we list several of the reviews, uh, you'll find some of those comparisons. Although, again, we what's one of our recommendations? We want to see some uh, outcomes estimation comparisons for the same project tool via tool. That would be great.
great. Um, there is. Uh, we have a question from Lisa. Did you report? Did your report discuss how watershed scale outcomes are being estimated? For example, are they just aggregating individual field outcomes? I think you noted this is required for some of the tools. This is important for tool users to understand because it assumes ad additivity, yet we know there can be trade-offs among different conservation practices. Yes. Um, you know, and the answer is it depends on the tool, right? So uh, groups that are committed to using um, nutrient tracking tool um, have the capability to interview the farmers involved and field by field come up with those outcomes and then outside of the tool aggregate those outcomes up to the project level or choose if they have the right data to align and make assumptions about management across much larger than single farmer operation areas can choose to um, analyze much larger fields or groups of fields or a small watershed, they can use the tool that way. Um, but yes, additivity is uh, challenging in some tools um, and, uh, and, and some tools are specialized at it. They're, they're meant to be aggregating, to taking aggregated information about individual behavior and practice adoption and analyzing it at the project scale. Those are the project focus tools. So we're at 101. Okay. Well, I can, I guess we can just keep going as, as long as people are still here and there's questions coming in. How does that sound? Sure. Yeah, there's three questions we've not answered if we want to. Um, Is there them. a role? Is there a role for remote sensing and estimating acres and practices as the first step in using these tools? Do you know of any project using remote sensing to help create a baseline or measure outcomes? Uh, nothing is, I, I know several projects that are using uh, remote sensing, uh, but not, I'm not aware of, I think it's tied to their estimating of, uh, of outcomes, yes. Um, and we are aware of a wonderful new report by EPA um, that reviews uh, options for remote sensing tools. Um, so I think, yeah, I, you know, nothing like adding more uh, levels of sophistication and uh, complication perhaps to the outcomes journey. But yeah, that would uh, be one way to inform the question. The first question out the gate is how many practices are being adopted? Because if you only rely on your data set of, uh, you know, cost share supported practices, you, you are at risk of ignoring the practices being adopted by farmers who are not involved in the cost share program. So remote sensing or the drive by uh, windshield surveys, uh, the transect surveys that some states and some projects are doing are also options to remote sensing. Are, uh, Michelle, there's another uh, one Emily, in here. Are there any tools that help out with monitoring the risks of pesticides in water? We unfortunately did not focus on that. Um, I think pesticides are getting, uh, they're the stepchild to nutrients and sediment, are they not? Um, though, you know, they should, they're just as important um, uh, for so many reasons. So uh, we unfortunately um, hope you take up that uh, next report focused on um, pesticide outcome estimation tools. And last question, because this attendee is still here um, by Michael Left. How similar or wild, widely different are findings from different tools, methods, when assessing the same data? That's the million dollar think, question today. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that question has been asked uh, several yeah. times. Um, yes. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think that is the next project uh, that should be funded, don't you? Um, but again, uh, always being mindful to make the reader aware of why you should and should not expect to that the outcomes should be similar um, or different, right? Because tools are different. They ask questions in different ways. They ask for different data. They ask for different levels of specificity. And they have different underlying environmental data sets and algorithms, right? So we should not maybe as default expect that they would all align, right? And then we can tease away what are the circumstances under which we do expect the results to align. 